So today we're going to continue with our discussion of atomic structure and periodicity and look at the quantum mechanical model of the atom and some things involved with that. Okay, so we talked about Bohr's model and how it only worked for hydrogen but not for other elements, and so we need to find a new model. And so some scientists named Heisenberg, de Broglie, and Schrodinger worked on coming up with this new model of the atom, and they came up with what's called wave mechanics or quantum mechanics. Remember, from physics, quantum means really small particles like electrons and, you know, even potentially atoms. So de Broglie said that an electron behaves as a particle and as a wave. And Schrodinger added to that saying that the electron is bound to the nu an electron bound to the nucleus is like a standing wave. And so we took these two things and came up with a new quantum mechanical model. So let's talk about what a standing wave is. Well, a standing wave is connected at both ends. So if you think about a rope and two people are holding it, those are the nodes. And so it's connected at both ends. One end isn't free. Only certain circumferences will allow standing waves. We don't want any overlap. And so this plays into our quantization that we talked about earlier, where if you think about kind of like stair steps, you have to be on one step or the other. You can't be in between. Okay, we had these very specific orbitals in the Bohr model. Now we're talking about these standing waves, but they're still very specific, so that's why we have quantization. So the equation for the wave function is this weird symbol. Looks like that. And it's also called an orbital, and it gives the electron's position in 3D space. So we've got this 3D, and we're, we're finding where the electron is. It's not a Bohr orbital, so don't get those confused. This is more 3D. A wave function does not give information on how the electron moves, so we're kind of just getting more its position, not how it got there. Okay, and this takes us to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So basically what this Heisenberg uncertainty principle says is that there's a limitation to just how precisely you can know both position and momentum or you know movement of the particle at a given time. And so we have this expression where delta x times delta m times v is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Well, delta x represents the uncertainty in the particle's position. So maybe x you know, representing a distance. You could think of it like that. Delta mv is the uncertainty in the particle's momentum. Because if you remember from physics, momentum is mass times velocity. And h represents Planck's constant. And so the more accurately you know a particle's position, the less accurately you're going to know its momentum, and then vice versa. So that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can't know both the position and the momentum. One's going to be sacrificed for the other. Okay, so let's kind of relate that to some probability. We're trying to predict where the electron's going to be or how it's going to move. So the square of the wave function, that weird symbol, indicates the probability of finding an electron near a particular point in space. So now we're looking at probability. And this is our big expression. We've got the wave function and then its position you know, in the x, y, z axis, and we are squaring them. So we've got one position, two positions. This is equal to n1 over n2. If n1 over n2 equals 100, this means that the electron is 100 times more likely to be found at position 1 than at position 2. So we're basically just calculating a probability. We can't say exactly that it's there for sure. Probability distribution uses an intensity of color to indicate the probability value at a given point in space. And we'll look at some pictures of that. So if you think of kind of like a heat map, it's a little bit like that. And these are also known as electron density maps because, you know, if we've got a larger density, we're probably going to find electrons there more often. Atomic orbitals are electron density maps. Remember, we're not talking about the Bohr orbital, but these wave mechanical model orbitals. And so here are some examples of the density maps. See how we've got the different colors, and that's representing the different densities. Um, here we've got an electron probability distribution with dots representing the electrons. And then we've taken that and kind of basically drawn a circle around 90% of the electrons and then come up with our boundary surface representation. Here's another one. Um, this is a different form, but basically we're kind of looking at the same thing. So we're, we're kind of tagging the electrons and then looking at where they occur most often. Uh, here's another example of different orbital shapes. 
Okay, let's look at some other interesting facts. So in the Bohr model, the electron was always found at a certain distance. Remember, we had those specific orbitals that the electron could be in. In the quantum mechanical model, it's the most probable distance at which the electron will be found. So remember, we're still incorporating probability here. We're saying most likely it's within this location or this area. So the size of an orbital cannot be defined precisely. Okay, but definition is that the orbital has a radius that encloses 90% of the electron probability. So basically, we take all those dots and we say, okay, well, we're going to turn it into a circle shape or you know whatever shape those electrons are occupying, and say, well, 90% of the time the electron is going to be within this shape. Okay, so we're not defining it precisely. We're saying 90% of the time it's going to be in this area somewhere. Okay, so let's relate this to some other information known as quantum numbers. Okay, each wave function, remember we're calling those orbitals, is characterized by a series of numbers called quantum numbers. And each quantum number describes a different property of the orbital. So we're going to go through some of those. So let's look at the principal quantum number first. So the principal quantum number is represented with a small n. And these are integral values, meaning it'll only be 1, 2, 3, 4, never a decimal or half. And these represent or are related to size and energy of the orbital. So that's the information this quantum number is giving. So as n increases, so as it gets bigger, the size of the atom is going to increase and the electron is going to get further from the nucleus. So if we have n equals 1, we have a relatively small atom. n equals 4, we have a larger atom than electrons further from the nucleus. Because the electron is further from the nucleus, it's less tightly bound, which means it's also going to have more energy. So as we increase the principal quantum number, we increase the amount of energy. All orbitals with the same value of n have the same energy. So, and we're going to talk about these letters in a minute, but we could have a 3s, a 3p, a 3d, and so because they all have the same value of n, they have the same energy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those letters that we just mentioned. So our next quantum number is the angular momentum quantum number, and that's represented with a lowercase l, one of those curvy ones. So these are integral values also from 0 to n minus 1 for each value of n. So if n is 3, l is 0, 1, or 2. Sometimes these are also called the subshells, and they're rel these give information on the shape. So n gave information on size and energy, L gives information on shape. And each value gets assigned a letter. So if L is 0, we call it the S subshell. If it's 1, it's called P, 2 is D, 3 is F, and there are more. 4 goes to G, and pretty much after that, we don't, ha we don't go further than 4. Okay, our next quantum number is the magnetic quantum number. So this is M sub L, and it has integral values between L and negative L, including 0. So if L was 2, M sub L would be 2, 1, 0, negative 1, and negative 2. So these give information on the orientation of the orbital in space relative to other orbitals. So we had N representing energy and size, L representing shape, M sub L now represents orientation. So let's take a look at an example. All right, so for principal quantum level n equals 5, determine the number of allowed subshells or different values of L and give the designation of each. So if n equals 5, we know that L is equal to n minus 1 to 0. So that means that L can be 4, 3, 2, or 1, Ooh, or 0. Okay. We know that L equals 0 represents S, so this is the 5S, 5 representing that N value. 1 is 5P, 2 represents 5D, 3 represents 5F, and because we have a 4 here, we can go to 5G. And so then each of these subshells has those different shapes, and we're going to look at those in a second. Okay, so let's look at some of those shapes. So we said that L equals 0 represented S. Well, the S orbital is spherical in shape. And remember how we talked about as the n value increases, the number, the amount of energy gets bigger and the atom itself gets larger. So you can see that for 1s, 2s, and 3s, same shape, except it's getting larger. So we have more energy to accommodate. 
Okay, then we went to the P subshell. These have a bit more complicated probability distribution, and they have positives and negatives depending on what access they are uh, inhabiting. So we've got uh, P sub Z, P sub X, and P sub Y, and they kind of look like a bowling pin or two lobes. Okay, then we went to D. Now, as we keep going, we're going to get kind of more complicated shapes. I don't know. Okay, so we don't start here until n equals 3, and then we can have some D levels, because we're not going to get to an L value of 2 until we have n equals 3. And so we've got um, our y and z, or x and z, so representing the different axes that the subshells are occupying. Okay, then we get into F, which gets even more complicated, and of course they don't start till n equals 4, because our L value needs to equal 3 in order to have F sub subshells. And so again, remember, these are representing those probabilities of electron locations. And we, yeah, like we said before, we don't see F and G I couldn't even find a picture of, so they're very uncommon. Okay, some other information. Hydrogen's electron can occupy any of its orbitals, but in the ground state, it will occupy the lowest energy orbital, which is always going to be 1s. Okay, but once it leaves ground state, it can occupy any of those other orbitals. If energy is put into the atom, then it's going to go to the excited state and move to some higher energy orbital, so from ground state to another higher energy. And let's take a look at some of the different... And let's see if I can get my arrow. Um, some of the different shapes, and maybe this will help, because sometimes it's hard to picture what these are all going to look like. Okay, so what atoms of elements really look like? So here we have hydrogen and helium. They only have one electron shell with a single orbital. Hydrogen has one electron, helium has two, so here we're in the 1s. Um, then we're going to lithium and beryllium. These have two electron shells. Um, so first we've got 1s, and that's full, and then we're going to 2s. And so here's our 1s, and then now we've got a bigger one, which is our 2s. Let me get my pen back. Let's see if I can write. No, okay. So then boron, now we're going 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, if you remember from electron configuration. So here's our 1s, whoops, 1s. 2s, and here's our 2p. Remember, 2p had three different orientations, x, y, and z. So this is one of those orientations. And now we're going to carbon, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Look at a. Yep, it should be 2p2. And so we've got 1s, 2s, and then here's our p's. Okay, sometimes um, we can have different energy where they can hybridize and so we've got a little bit different orientation for carbon and we'll talk about hybridization a little bit later on so basically what you can see is that as we keep adding electrons our atoms getting larger we're going up in those energy levels from n equals one n equals two etc and then we're adding all these subshells and so everything keeps getting larger so what I want to show you is when we go to the 3s so here we've got 1s 2s are 2p's, and now sodium and magnesium also occupy the 3s. And so you can see that it, it just keeps getting more complicated. Okay, so we've got this more complicated as we keep going and we keep space filling, and um, it can get pretty crazy. So here we've got the 4s, so all the way through 3s, 3p is all occupied within here, and then we went to 4s. So you could just keep going, and this is kind of a cool website to just show you, you know, how all these things continue to overlap and get larger. So here are the check for understanding questions for the third section, uh, the quantum mechanical model. So number one, what is a wave function? Number two, what is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Number three, what is an electron density map? Number four, what is the difference between the Bohr model and the quantum mechanical model in terms of where electrons are found in the atom. And the last question, given the set of quantum numbers, identify and explain each part. So for 4PY, explain what the 4, the P, and the Y are, what they're called, and what they represent. So we'll discuss these in class. Have a good day.